So the earlier discussion was just kind of a warm up for what we're about to cover here. And that's basically the various states that exist and are transitioned to and from in the Java thread lifecycle. So the Java thread lifecycle can be represented as a state machine. You can find out about the various states if you go to this link, which lists all the states that we show on this diagram. It's a lot easier to understand if you look at it visually, of course, but you're welcome to take a look at that link. And you can also uh, see a discussion of the state machine itself by taking a look at this link. Threads begin when you create a new thread object. So if you have a class called myThread that inherits or extends the thread class, then when you say new myThread, you're going to create a new thread. And that, of course, will transition you into the new state. And that's actually one of the states. So when a thread's in the new state, it doesn't actually do any computation. It just exists. It has come into, into being. When you start the thread, when you say, you know, my thread start, assuming you have a variable called my thread, then that actually begins the wheels in motion, sets the wheels in motion. And you can see when you say thread start, that will create a runtime thread stack. We'll talk later about how this works in terms of what really is doing the work under the hood. But basically, there are different layers involved. And this will be creating a new runtime thread stack, typically managed by the underlying operating system kernel. So new thread uh, makes it in the new state. MyThread.start creates the runtime stack. And that will then transition us to the runnable state. Now, when you're in the runnable state, this does not actually mean that you're running. It just means you're capable of being running, that the resources have been allocated. If you recall our discussion about the happens before relationship, that means that the state of the thread object has been propagated to the right places in the memory hierarchies of the different processor cores. And so now we're ready to hit the ground running and actually do some work. The thread scheduler is what actually controls when a given thread starts to run. And the reason for that, of course, is that there could be many threads that are ready to run, but there'll only be as many threads running as there are cores that can run them. So assuming we have, you know, say, 10 threads and four cores, then at any given point in time, there'll be perhaps 10 runnable threads, 10 threads that have been started, but they won't actually be running because they have to get access to the underlying processor core to actually do anything useful. So the scheduler says, aha, I'm going to pick this particular thread, my thread, and I'm going to allow it to start running. So what happens there is we then transition into the running state. And if you were to actually you know, run the debugger and look inside what's going on in your thread object, you would see that there's a state enumerated variable that keeps track of the state. And now it would be in the running state. And so once it's in the running state, then things can actually start to happen. So this will end up invoking the run hook method that you define either by passing something to the constructor, like a runnable, or by um, you know, overriding the uh, run method in the thread. Or, or you can also create a new runnable object. There's various ways of doing this. So at that point, the Java execution environment, which could be the Java virtual machine. It could be Dalvik if you're earlier versions of Android. It could be the Android runtime or Art if you're the later versions of Android, et cetera. Whatever the underlying execution environment is, that will invoke the thread's run hook method. And now you're running in application user land, right? The user or somebody wrote that code. Of course, it could be a system thread. But the point is that this is code that's no longer running inside the operating system kernel. You've now transitioned into places where actual computations of interest to a program will be done. Now, various things can happen while you're running in that particular run hook method. So one thing you could do is that the thread's run hook, or a method called by the thread's run hook method, can call other methods that cause the thread to do various things that involve time. So for example, you can call sleep, and you can wait for you know, 20 milliseconds. You could call wait with a timeout, which says, put me to sleep for this amount of time or until something gets notified. You could call join which says, I want to wait for another thread, but I'm going to wait for up to this amount of time for the, the other thread to show up. If you do any of those kinds of things, then two things happen. First of all, the thread that does these calls will be suspended. 
either sleeping or waiting or joining. And the underlying system will transition into the timed wait state. So now we're in the timed wait state. And we'll see that that's actually distinct from another kind of state we'll talk about in a second. Um, so the thread is sleeping, it's waiting, it's joining with a timeout. And then at some point, let's assume that the timeout elapses before you get what you want. Or in the case of sleep, you're just done because you timed, you, you, your, timer, your time period elapsed. So in that particular case, the wait time elapses. And now you go back to the runnable state. So you don't start running right away. You're just capable of being run. So you're going to go ahead and kind of wait in the queue, the, the scheduler's queue, for your chance to get access to the underlying core. At some point, it'll be your turn. And that could be based on various factors. Um, for example, you could have set the priority of the thread in such a way where you'd get access to you know, higher priority relative to other waiting threads. But whatever, at some point, it's your turn to run again. The scheduler then says, go ahead, run this particular thread. It transitions to the running state. And of course, the run hook method gets called again. And, and, and in this case, it's not so much that the run hook method gets called back, it's just that you resume running at wherever you had left off when you were doing a timed wait. So um, I don't want you to think that it's like run got reinvoked, but now you're back in the context of something where the run hook method is, is called somewhere on the runtime stack. And so you're continuing to do whatever you were doing before the point when you were suspended. Like the wait, the timed wait may have returned, the sleep may have returned, the um, timed join may have returned, and now you're continuing to do stuff. There are other things you might choose to do. So you might try to access a guarded resource. So you might do things like try to get access to um, another thread's monitor. So you have another object, another, another there's a, uh, sorry, not another thread, there, there's a monitor object, another Java object. You try to access one of its methods which are synchronized either with a method or with a statement. And for whatever reason, that resource may be in use because someone else has got the lock. So in that case, you will go into the blocking state. And this would happen when you're trying to get a guarded resource, like a monitor lock, that's currently being held by another thread. So now you're blocked. You're awaiting someone else releasing that resource by exiting the critical section, for example. And so your thread is, again, sleeping. And at some point, when the other thread who owned that resource gives it up, and it's your turn, you can access that resource. And in this case, the thread is no longer blocked, and it acquires the resource. And now, once again, you transition back to the runnable state, but you're not running. You're just capable of being run. Same thing as before. So you'll park there for a while. And um, interestingly enough, the, the state for blocking I.O. is actually runnable, which is kind of bizarre. But if you can read this for more about that. But the point is that um, you're not running, you're runnable. Then again, when it's your turn, you are made running, and your run hook method continues at whatever point it was left off before when it was suspended, blocking on some guarded resource. And then you might decide to call the wait operation, the non-timed wait operation on the, uh, the monitor, on your monitor. So the thread could call wait on its own monitor condition, which implies that the monitor lock must have already been acquired because you can't call wait, or you can't legally call wait unless you've already acquired the lock. Otherwise, you'll get, I think, an illegal state exception or something like that. So at this point, you will then go ahead and transition to the waiting state where you'll be blocked, waiting for someone to signal you. At some point, someone will notify you or notify you, notify you amongst other threads. And so you'll wake up out of waiting. Now, again, you'll probably also have to then maybe transition into blocked because you might not get the lock right away. But at any rate, you're, you're waiting. Um, and at some point, you know, if let's assume you get the lock right away, then you transition over here to runnable, which again, doesn't start to run immediately. When it's your turn, you start to run. And then at some point, the run method ends. And you may recall from our much earlier discussion about the run method, the way that you 
a thread stops running is either to gracefully fall off the end of run when you're done, or you ungracefully get kicked out of run when an exception occurs. So in any, any case, you're no longer running, you are, um, you've exited through whatever means, and then you transition to the terminated state. And once you're in the terminated state, the thread is effectively um, no longer needed. And at some point, the memory can be reclaimed. And there's some subtleties there. But the point is that you're not able to do any further computations with that thread. And if you were to check that thread and say, are you alive? It would say, no, I'm not alive. I've been terminated. Um, and then you, the environment can eventually recycle the resources, like the stack and so on. OK, so that's kind of an overview of the states in a thread. Now, the, the key thing I want you to note, and we'll talk more about this um, a little bit further in the next video, is that there's a lot of states involved. And obviously, you're transitioning between them. And sometimes you're running. Sometimes you're blocking. Sometimes you're waiting. Sometimes you're time waiting. Sometimes you're runnable. And so it's actually a fair amount of overhead happening to make all these things work properly. And so I'll talk about this next. But the key point to remember is that threads are not just completely free. They have overhead associated with them. And hopefully, this walkthrough of their various states gives you a better sense of why there's overhead and what that overhead might be. OK, so that's the end of the discussion of the state machine slides.